But look at the back. That causes alarm bells to go off because this means this back has been knocked off, the side has been cut down, and the back has been shoved back on again. So, you know, as soon as you see that, you start looking more. Take all the drawers out, and lo and behold, this important Connecticut American 18th century French splay footed Heppel White chest of drawers sold at the Marshall Field Company in their antique store about 30 years ago turns out to have three different pieces of furniture inside it. The back with nail holes to nowhere and scarring here was off something that had shelves. That's where a shelf was. Don't need shelves inside a chest of drawers. Those drawers, they'd been borrowed from something else. The backs had been whacked off and the piece had been made shallower. It's all worked over. And this was very typical of what went on in the American furniture industry uh, in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, taking pieces and making better pieces, improving pieces. So not just the English did it, the Americans did it also. Uh, again, you know, great patina, hand cutting, and then where this screw is, we can see disturbed oxidation that is very distressing. All of that is on one piece of furniture. Let your fingers do the walking. Touch all of the exterior surfaces. They should be smooth to the touch after 200 years. If you touch the bottom of that chest of drawers, you will find it is as sharp as can be. You'll get a few splinters because it's nothing but plywood used to make these ghastly feet and all new base. It's just a chop job from a very cheap English cabinet shop where they were taking big chests of drawers and making them little. We'll come back to that issue in a moment. All antiques have shrinkage because all wood shrinks over time. So always look for shrinkage. Don't say, oh, it's got a split on the side. Say, hooray, it's got a split on the side. You know, oh, it's got a split in the bottom of the drawer. Yes, it's got a split in the bottom of the drawer. That's what we want to see. We want to see that the wood has been shrinking for 200 years and that it has pulled apart and that it shows signs of being there for 200 years. And if it doesn't, it's not old. It's as simple as that because all wood shrinks, even inlay. This piece, if you carefully look at where all of this inlay comes together, you will find shrinkage. And you'll be able to feel and see. And I brought you a toy to pass around. And in fact, well, the inside will do just as well. I want you to remember it has hinges. Be gentle. Feel how you can feel the inlay. You can feel the pattern of this shell as you touch it. You can feel all of this edge. And when you open it up, you'll feel where it's been protected, much less of that, because it is the air getting to it that is causing the wood to shrink. It, the air is drying it out. So the more protected it is, the less shrinkage. The less protected it is, the more. But you can feel this. So I'm going to start that with you. And this is a signed uh, Tehan piece um, from France that I'm passing around next. And again, now this is 19th century. So when you feel it, even though you will feel where the wood comes together, and you'll look at it and you'll see a little gap, little dark line, you know, you'll, you'll feel, of course, there's a little tiny piece of brass there, too, so that's pretty skillful stuff going on. But you can feel it beginning to shrink. You can feel it beginning to get little crack lines across there. You can feel little spots across the front. There's no inlay along here. This is shrinkage where these points are coming together. So let's, you know, 
it's almost going to be better if you felt that one and you feel this one. So we just go all the way around and then come back. So everybody gets to feel them, but feel them one after the other fairly close to each other. Remember, this is 130 or 40 years old. That one's uh, 240 years old. So you're looking at the difference in shrinkage over that amount of time, okay? So, no shrinkage, no antique. Carving. Well, if, yes? Sure. It still will have shrunk. Bec that will not protect it. The faker loves inlay. I used to have a dear friend in, in the antiques business here in North Carolina. She said, never buy an inlaid piece of furniture in North Carolina. All the inlay was added in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, there's some truth to that uh, as you go around looking at southern country furniture. But... Um, the other thing fakers love to do is carve. They just can't resist taking something simple and carving it. And there's a very easy way, again, to think logically and understand how carving was done, planned for, and executed. When this leg was planned, when this leg was planned, carving for that arch was planned. He knew he was putting that carving there. So when he cut out that leg, he left extra wood to carve. The faker who buys a smooth-legged table has no extra wood. He has to carve down into the surface of the piece. And any time you see carving on a leg, and it doesn't leap off the surface, you know it is later <coughs> carving. It is not original carving. It jumps off the surface. It does not sink in. There are some types of intaglio, which is sunken carving, that are legitimate, but they don't appear there, for instance. Most carving, look at the carving here along the edge. It was, that was glued on but it stands proud, it leaps off, it doesn't sink in. Sinking in, be suspicious. Sometimes you encounter bad carving. Now this is on an 18th century piece of furniture, it's an 18th century chair, but look how dreadful the carving is, look how unfinished the background is, look how sloppy this is, and you say to yourself, ooh, why would an 18th century cabinet maker do something like that? Well, he was going to gild it. And this has lost its gilding. So all of this rough surface held the gesso. And it was the gesso that then was carefully and brilliantly smooth. All of this awkwardness became perfectly smooth with the building up of the gesso and then of the carving down of the gesso. So we're only looking at the base. So when you encounter that, you know that it once was gilded and it is worthless. Then there's carved, carving that was planned. It just happens to have been planned by a machine. And on the leg, it does jump up, but it's just insipid. You know, I mean, that is a quote-unquote Philadelphia Chippendale-esque chair. This is part of the colonial revival period. I, I, I did a book on that era. It's a fascinating era, but so much was done wrong. They just didn't understand what it was they were doing. And also, they had all these here in High Point and Elf places, they had these fabulous machines that would do all this fun stuff. So, you know, why have it simple here when you have a machine that can just bang, bang, bang and do all that fun stuff? So, you know, you just glop it up, glop it up, glop it up. 
and above all, those poor legs and that poor ball and claw, you know, I mean, it's just like uh, going to sleep. So let's look at a couple of case studies. One is the George III chest, and the other is an American, Queen Anne Dropleaf. We want to share and share alike. Here we have it. What you see over and over in auction catalogs, in antique shops everywhere. I can read you the description out of my head. An elegant, small, desirable, three-drawer bachelor chest, circa 1790, raised on elegant French splay feet with a flowing apron and an exuberant mahogany surface with fine oval brasses, blah de blah de blah 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 Well, there are two things that tell you that's a fake from here to as far as you can see. One. One, two, three drawers. Georgian chests have either four drawers or five drawers. They don't have three drawers. Okay? So, that sends the alarm bells off. It's a cute little thing. And it has Brahma locks. We can come back to Brahma locks, but they're a type of locking mechanism invented around 1800. Uh, so it can't be on an 18th century piece. But here is the same chest of drawers. These are the same chest of drawers. Okay? And this is a long time ago that this book was done showing taking this big chest. By the way, on the back we have a a circular saw mark, which again is not 18th century, generally speaking, although there's some evidence that in London you might have found some right at the end of the 18th century, but not likely. Tear it all apart. Think of the work involved, you know. This is at a time when labor is cheap. This is about 1940 to 50 that this is being done. Well, 45 to 50, after the war. But you can see all the beautiful dovetailed parts, all of that being all pounded apart, everything knocked down. You've got to take every drawer apart. You've got to cut down the width of every single bit of it. And then you've got to put it all back together eventually. Here, see, he's cutting the drawer. He's taking the veneer off. You know why he's doing that? Because those big knobs were in the wrong place for a small chest. So he can't get rid of the hole behind that pretty veneer, but he can sure as heck take that veneer off and put that pretty veneer on. And you can buy pretty veneer anytime. You can still buy pretty veneer today. And here he's molding the top edge to a new edge, and he's using the kind of a mold uh, uh, that would have been used actually by an 18th century cabinet maker. This one just happens to be a new one. And voila, a few days later, what cost him 20 pounds to buy at auction, he has sold for 125 pounds. So he has earned a nice profit for his efforts. Or in today's market, what cost him 100 pounds to buy, he has sold for 300 pounds. And he's still made a profit, and they're still doing this today. And there's the back of it. And look at that. Two big, gorgeous boards. And what don't we see any of? We don't see any shrinkage. Because he couldn't bear to leave a gap on, after all that effort he put into it. He didn't want to leave any shrunken lines back there. And this is at Sotheby's King Street, or New Bond Street, rather, <coughs> London, in a major sale, being advertised as authentic, and we took it apart, and absolutely and positively, we found the marks showing that it had been cut down from a large chest. Just never trust a three-drawer chest unless it was made in France. 